to welcome everybody to the Life and Breath Foundation speaker series. Uh, we're happy uh, to have uh, been able to share the uh, information, expertise, and provide some dialogue from some of the more prominent individuals in healthcare surrounding the sarcoidosis and the research of sarcoidosis, the management of sarcoidosis, and the things that affect uh, sarcoidosis. Uh, my name is Sean Hall. I am the president and founder of the Life and Breath Foundation. Uh, we were, we've were we been established since 1998. Um, I started the foundation in memory of my mother, Ida Hall, who uh, tragically passed away with the disease at age 59. Um, the family members, myself, did not know she had it. Um, the understanding is she probably struggled for 13 years by herself, uh, we're located here in the Baltimore, uh, Maryland area, and so we were fortunate to have Johns Hopkins um, here in the uh, in the community, uh, taking care of folks not only locally but internationally. So I went over to Johns Hopkins and uh, visited with um, some doctors at the Sarcoidosis Clinic, Dr. Dave Muller, uh, to just find out a little bit more about the disease, to find out how I could help. Uh, and try to understand, you know, why this disease took my mother. She had it in, the, in, in, in her lungs and suffered from the pulmonary effects of what sarcoidosis brought. So um, hearing, um, knowing that I wanted to do something in her memory, I uh, established the foundation, as I said. Um, there's some important um, objectives and mission that I have. Dr. Kaplan, if you could go to that uh, first slide, I'd like to share um, kind of what the Life and Breath Foundation is looking to um, provide and, um, and our, uh, our primary goals uh, with the foundation is to offer the sarcoidosis community effective tools to track your journey, decipher medical issues and maximize the quality of life. You know, there's a lot of misdiagnosis that occurs. We wanna make sure that we build a bridge um, that you can understand exactly what you have, understand what some of the things alternative wise you should consider and give you the tools to be able to do that. A lot of those tools are found on our website uh, that we invite you to come take a look at. It's also important for us to provide a nurturing environment so that those that are affected by sarcoidosis can share their experiences. This is the environment. This is uh, one of the things that we try to do to be able to bridge the gap, to help you understand that you are not by yourself uh, you're not struggling by yourself, your family's being supportive, but you have another family in the foundation that is able to reach out not only regionally, uh, but across the United States and, um, and internationally also. Uh, we want to be there for you to provide this experience so that you can understand that there's other people that are affected, there's other people that you can learn from, and we want to make sure you have that bond set up. And the last of which is to build more of awareness within the medical community to help combat this chronic disease. We think there's an educational component that not only exists with the patients, but with some of the doctors, with some of the practicing doctors and some of the doctors that are coming in to uh, become doctors so that we can help them understand that, you know, this disease affects different organs and uh, just to be aware as you are interacting with uh, our patients. So uh, without further ado, I wanted to introduce our guest speaker this evening. We're proud to have Dr. Adam Kaplan who is a adjunct uh, member of the faculty at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Kaplan, welcome. Uh, could you give us a little bit uh, of an introduction and tell us a little bit more about your career and what brings you here today? Um, it's my pleasure. Uh, and Sean, really, please call me Adam. I'm so impressed with what you've created and what you've done here. And, uh, you know, you found, as we talk about in medicine, uh, we're doing more and more research on purpose in life, and you found your purpose. And it's uh, in addition to how you help people manage their finances and their lives and what they're going to do, that you reach out and help people with this, you know, awful condition about which we don't know nearly enough and about which, um, you know, people are isolated because it's an uncommon condition, so they don't hear from each other and other people. And, you know, just talking about educating the doctors, you know, if the doctors are going to be honest with you, um, you know, what we learn about these illnesses, we learn from one patient and teach another. So um, with a rare condition, uh, one that you, you know, may not see during your training in medical school, 
uh, or even residency, this is a great opportunity to provide that kind of information. So thank you for allowing me to uh, come. Um, my, uh, my pedigree is pretty easy. I did my MD PhD training at Johns Hopkins, kind of had fallen into the black hole there of uh, doing the triple threat, trying to be a clinician, a researcher, and a teacher. And uh, I focused on autoimmune diseases and when the immune system gets uh, activated, how it then causes above the neck symptoms as well as below the neck symptoms, such as depression, anxiety, cognitive impairment, and those kinds of things. And uh, um, so Ellen, who works with you, had uh, the chance, I think, to see me give a talk and had told you something about it. And now I'm here and I have a chance to kind of uh, communicate with the community that you've created. It's kind of a weird time we live in because I can't see them, but I know that they're out there somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, they are out there. <laughs> yes. Um, so shall I just get started then, Sean? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So um, so the, the first thing actually, before I get started, so I'm a neuropsychiatrist by training, meaning I have a uh, a research degree in neuroscience and a uh, health degree in psychiatry. And so the question is, uh, just to get us started, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is one, but the light bulb has to want to change. So I'm hoping today that those people who are out there want to change the way they think perhaps about depression um, as not, you know, gee, you'd be depressed too, or this is just you know, someone not being able to tough it out or suck it up, um, but really um, trying to convince you that, especially in these autoimmune diseases, depression is really a symptom of the immune system getting activated. So that's my goal today. I'm going to start off by just telling you why you should care about depression. So it turns out um, depression is uh, involved in 90% of the suicides that happen. Um, and right now, suicide is the um, second leading cause of death for our young people in this country, between the age of 10 and 34, suicide's the second leading cause of death. It's the 10th leading cause of death um, of across all ages, because as we get older, other things, um, diabetes and uh, heart disease and those kinds of things. Ironically, right now, COVID is the second leading cause of death behind heart disease, which is just incomprehensible. Um, but we'll sort of talk about that. So um, the problem is that the rates have been going up. In fact, they've been going up on average um, uh, about you know, 20 to 30%. And you can see that in some places in our country, um, they've been going up even higher. Um, and uh, so, um, and that's, again, we're not only not winning the battle, we're losing the battle a bit here. This shows you something interesting, which uh, isn't well discussed. We're really good at looking at risk factors, not protective factors. So it turns out white men uh, have had, you know, have the highest rate of suicide. Um, and this is over the past few years, the rates have been going up. Um, also for um, African-American, uh, I'm just trying to make sure African-American men, it's been staying about the same. Uh, all things change with COVID, by the way. So this is pre-COVID. But one thing that has been the case is that African-American women, for some reason, they just hug the line here. Um, they are least likely to commit suicide of any group of people in, you know, in our country, be it people who have uh, you know, religious affiliations and the like. So something about African-American women that we have not well studied or appreciated um, is, is a correlate of people who just don't kill themselves. So just to let you know, um, just to show you here, um, and, and um, it is guns that do kill people. So the problem is I'm all for people owning guns. Um, but if you own a gun and you have someone who's depressed, please get that out of your house. Don't let it be there because it is guns that account, as you can see, why the rates are so high in some areas. So here's the suicide rates. Here's the gun ownership. And you can kind of see what happens here. So guns are what the problem with guns is there's, you know, almost no margin of uh, error here when people go to try to kill themselves, which is why women are three times more likely to attempt suicide and men are three times more likely to kill themselves. So what is depression? Well, this is the criteria that we use according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM-5 now, which is you have to have five of these nine symptoms. We remember them, the SIG-EM-CAPS, 
believe it or not, actually mean something to a doctor. SIG is how you tell someone to take their medicine. So take one tablet by mouth twice a day uh, and then caps or caplets. So <clears throat> the, uh, it stands for sleep and often it's early morning awakenings. There's changes in sleep architecture. You can actually measure that people will have, um, they'll go right into REM sleep early at night. Normally the REM sleep is later in the morning and you go into a deep sleep early at night. That's not the case with people who have depression. So that people often wake up um, because they'll go into REM and never get into those deep sleeps. And then they'll wake up early in the morning, can't fall back asleep. Their get up and go has gotten up and gone. That's the loss of interest or pleasure. Feelings of guilt or worthlessness, which gets in the way of people. There's already stigma associated with having mental uh, illnesses. And these are people who are very susceptible to it. They think that they don't deserve the time or energy and don't want to be labeled as you know, having a mental illness. So this is a big problem. Um, decreased energy or fatigue, low mood, uh, and that's sadness. But realize sadness is just one of these nine symptoms and you don't need to have sadness and still get the diagnosis of depression. So for instance, in the young and very old, instead of sadness, what we often see is irritability. Uh, concentration problems, appetite changes, either, oops, the computer's getting a little, uh, uh, getting away from me here. Um, so uh, appetite changes, and that's either food doesn't taste good anymore, uh, and people lose weight. Um, sometimes they get diagnosed with, uh, worked up rather for cancer when really it's just depression, or their satiety center, they don't have uh, the ability to feel satiated, uh, like that's enough. And so they keep eating chocolates and those kinds of things. So they put on a lot of weight, it's what's called psychomotor retardation. Those people are not their bubbly selves, however bubbly they normally are. And then thoughts of death. You must have either decreased interest or decreased mood. And then five of nine symptoms total that for greater than two weeks, the more symptoms you have, the more likely you are to respond to treatment. So now everybody here can make the diagnosis. If you have any questions, um, you can always ask the significant other. So this says, after many years of marital bliss, tension enters the Kent household, and Lois Lane is embroidering stupid on Superman's cape. Now, I can't tell you if Lois Lane is depressed and her Superman isn't so super, or if Clark Kent is depressed and he's not putting on his cape, oh my goodness, uh, and going out and saving people. But what I can tell you is that, like it or not, um, the people who live with people who have depression are getting the real deal. So we all have to invest a lot of energy when we go out into the world. People say, hey, how you doing, Adam? They don't want me to say, oh, I'm having a really hard time, had a bad weekend, can we sit and talk about it? They want me to say, fine, everything's good, have it yourself. So you have to, you know, if you're depressed, people tend to try to fake it till you can make it, and they put on a lot of energy. You just have to imagine all the energy it takes to pretend like you're enjoying the conversation and you're listening when really the inner um, dialogue you're having is saying this person probably thinks I'm stupid, I am stupid, I'm a worthless person and the like. So they finally get home and they can just be their normal depressed self. And I hear this all the time from significant others. They say, well, you know, he's fine when he goes out to parties and then he comes home and he just sits there like a bump on a log. And that's not because they don't, uh, that they're acting different with you because this is, you know, some different person. That's who they really are. So are you getting enough oxygen? So speaking of significant others, uh, caregivers often um, don't realize that there's a bit of survivor's guilt that come to everybody, uh, just about everybody I've seen, just about who has a loved one who gets an illness like sarcoidosis. Um, there's a bit of a survivor's guilt. And so it often is, I can't go out to the movies because my loved one, uh, you know, has a hard time getting around or, you know, it's breathless or whatever the limitation is. Um, so I'm just going to stay at home uh, and just be with that person 100% of the time. And the problem with that is it's like if the oxygen mask dropped down, are you going to put them on first yourself or your loved one? And the answer is you got to put it on yourself first because the air gets sucked out of that airplane. You have 20 seconds, 30 seconds before you pass out and the other person passes out while you're trying to get the mask on them. If you put the mask on yourself first, you can fight with them for you know however long you want to fight with them or Give them 30 seconds, they'll be sleeping beside you. You just put the mask on, everybody makes it. So the point I'm just trying to make is that you have to get out of the house at least once a week. And that's not for yourself. 
that's for your loved one. And those people who have sarcoidosis, please push your loved one out at least once a week so they can recharge their engines, go out and be with friends or see, you know, go hiking or whatever it is that they need to do so that they recharge their engines and they're there for you when they need to be. So what do we know about sarcoidosis? Unfortunately, sar sarcoidosis is an uncommon condition that quite frankly, um, I believe, although not everybody would agree, I think many people would, that because it's a one uncommon condition and two tends to, has traditionally affected African-Americans uh, in, in a greater preponderance, it has not been a condition that has had nearly enough resources and time and energy put into uh, investigating it. So um, this is what is known, which isn't a lot, so uh, about depression and sarcoidosis. So one thing you can see here is that essentially, doesn't matter what your age is, and it doesn't matter what your um, uh, sex is, whether you're male or female, you have about the same risk of having depression across the age range. So it's an equal opportunity offender depression is. It uh, is very democratic in that sense. Age and gender don't matter. Um, and that's different because in our uh, general population, women are twice as likely to have depression as our men. So this is already telling you that this is a biology going on here. This isn't just some other phenomenon. Uh, the predictors are if you have uh, uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis involving the lungs, then the more difficulty you have with breathing. Um, and if you have additional diseases on top of sarcoidosis, those increase your risk of depression. This is a study that came uh, out of Hopkins. Um, Dr. Sharp is uh, someone I've worked with. She's uh, one of the newer, Dr. Muller has retired. And so Dr. Sharp has taken over his practice and does a lot of the uh, work. And I've done research with her at Hopkins. And basically they found that there was roughly 40 to 60% of people had some in the sarcoidosis clinic had some degree of depression. But, um, but what was interesting is that if you looked at hospitalizations in the past year, there was no difference between the severity, this is increasing severity of depression, but the higher your depression, the more likely you were to uh, go to the emergency room. And the presumption is that, um, you know, people who are depressed, they tend to not take as good care of themselves. They smoke even if they have, you know, pulmonary symptoms and stuff and they don't exercise. And um, they also think, you know, when something happens, it's like the sky is falling and, uh, and the like. So that's just something to keep in mind. So um, there are lots of causes, anything that affects the brain, either directly through a stroke, uh, this is cerebrovascular accident, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, MS that I spent most of my time studying at Hopkins uh, is the Michael Phelps. It has 50% um, on average uh, um, chance of getting a clinical depression. But sarcoidosis is really, you know, hanging up there too. It's not far off from MS. Oh my goodness. And, uh, and so it really is just like these other conditions that affect the brain it has high rates of depression. What do we know about MS? Well, MS is you know, much more common. It's been around, uh, well-researched. MS is more like one in 500 people, one in 300 women, one in maybe five, 600 men. Um, kind of, uh, now we understand it's probably you know, the rate of ADHD I mean, uh, in, in, in some people. So in any case, uh, we know that depression correlates with quality of life for people with MS. It also Depression is the number one correlate of quality of life for their family. We know it has significant morbidity, meaning it affects people's function and mortality. Suicide is seven times more common in people with MS and 10% of people with MS will actually attempt suicide. 30% will have thoughts of it. So it is a lethal part of the illness. MS causes depression. We know that it's due to overactivation of the immune system. If you block the immune system, you actually have antidepressant effects because it's the immune system and uh, all of the inflammation that goes on that causes it. It's not due to weakness or a personality flaw. Um, it doesn't correlate with disability or gender. It's not, gee, you'd be depressed too if you were in a wheelchair because it doesn't matter uh, if you're upright and walking or in a wheelchair, it matters how much inflammation is going on. 
Depression also worsens MS. Um, so MS causes the depression, but the depression makes the immune system more uh, out of control. And in fact, treating the depression improves the MS. So it's a two-way street. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, um, and this is again, probably applies much of this to sarcoidosis, just that we've studied MS more because it's one of the more common uh, autoimmune diseases. So depression is treatable in MS and you can restore people back 100% to their old selves if you give them the proper treatment. Talk therapy and antidepressants are often needed. So this just shows um, that one of the things about depression, why is it that depression worsens MS? Well, it turns out the thing about depression that we know is people with depression have elevated cortisol levels. And people say, oh, well, cortisol is the stress hormone. Um, I don't think of cortisol as the stress hormone because nobody goes to the pharmacy and says, I need some prednisone because I'm stressed. They go because they say, I need some prednisone because it's an anti-inflammatory and it's the break of the immune system. So here's the problem. If you have elevated cortisol levels, this is the more depressed you are, the higher your levels of cortisol uh, are all the time, you're basically riding your emergency brake while you're driving, which means you're gonna wear it out. And now your immune system will not be able to quiet down when you pull that emergency brake because what's going on is um, it stopped listening. So here's what happens. Stress causes the release of these signaling molecules. Your cortisol goes up, glucocorticoid uh, goes up. And now this break of the immune system that was telling all of these immune cells to quiet down and just chill um, no longer can. So if you get infected with something, uh, in the case of MS, Epstein-Barr virus is thought to trigger MS in some people by hiding and looking like myelin. That's what that virus does. Um, and now if you get infected and you've been depressed, your immune system is going to be overactive and you won't be able to shut it down. It says, of course, your daddy loves you. He's on Prozac. He loves everybody. It uh, didn't have to be the case, but it turns out that uh, I wasn't so stupid by studying MS. Uh, a lot of people said, oh, you're going to study depression and MS, but that's not going to help us understand depression outside of MS. Well, it turns out now um, this is 2020, that all of the antidepressants that we've studied all have anti-inflammatory effects, which means that we have been studying inflammation going on in our patients who don't have autoimmune diseases because the, it's not a coincidence that all of these antidepressants have anti-inflammatory properties. And there was a study that came out last year that showed, in fact, 60% or more people who have depression without an autoimmune disease have smoldering elevated levels of inflammation. So what about COVID? I'm just gonna end with COVID here. Let's just see how we're doing. Okay, we're getting to the end uh, and in time for questions. So this is the culprit here. It doesn't look so bad necessarily when you're looking at it here, but COVID uh, is caused by SARS-CoV-2. It's this coronavirus. It infects cells and then it splits off from the cells and steals some of their membrane. And when it gets into trouble, the trouble it causes is because of these increased cytokines. Cyto means cell, kine means kinetic, it means movement. So cytokines get immune cells moving, which basically means cytokines are to immune cells what neurotransmitters are to neurons. They're the way neurons communicate is through a neurotransmitter and the way immune cells communicate is through cytokines. That's what happens. You get the cytokine storm and it turns on the entire immune system and then you're off to the races. This is just phases of uh, psychological response to disasters. We've had disasters before, 1918, 1919 was the, uh, you know, swine flu uh, pandemic that by the way, killed 650,000 people in this country, which is a lot of people, but we're on our way there now, people. So there's something wrong that we're not gonna beat uh, where we were then. But anyway, normally it happens, the community kind of comes together. There's a honeymoon period, then there's this disillusionment, we're here still. But just be aware that even when this is finally over, and hopefully we will have it over when you know people get vaccinated and we get further along, there will be a year at least of rebuilding and adjusting and restoration. Uh, people who have the harder time uh, have one history of trauma, history of being in some kind of 
uh, stress or crisis before, the duration, and of course this seems endless now as we're in our second year, and ambiguity, we have not been getting good signals and good consistent information about these conditions. So it can cause many things. Um, again, risk factors as we talked about, other stresses, uh, degree of trauma, prior psychiatric history, has all sorts of common distress reactions, but this is the big three, major depression, um, not just low mood, but this clinical depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and, uh, and drug use, particularly alcohol. This is just a study that happened, to two studies, one that happened before uh, COVID, one that happened during or now after or during COVID. And it just shows us that if you look since COVID, the rates of depression in people who aren't infected or haven't gotten COVID itself just are part of society have gone up dramatically, but this makes the point, it's our young people that are hit the hardest. So just be aware that it's, you know, it's our young people who really are having the hard time. That's, uh, yeah, that's it. This is also something nobody expected. Uh, it turns out during um, pandemics, people tend to be less likely to kill themselves and commit suicide. And so the rates, as you can see, had gone down um, here. Uh, but they've gone down, you can see the green here is the total, and blue is white, so they've gone down from 2019 to 2020, except they went up at least two, you know, twofold um, among non-white individuals, uh, uh, Blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and others. So this was completely unexpected that this rate has gone up so dramatically. Uh, and you know, particularly in Baltimore City, where it's high uh, African American population, the, the rates have gone up. Not surprisingly, this came out uh, about a month ago and showed that four months out, on average, from having gotten uh, COVID nineteen, fifty two percent of people met uh, criteria for major depression, which everybody now knows as SIGIM caps. Um, but in any case, high rates of depression. Um, and the rates correlated with these markers. C-reactive protein is a marker of inflammation going on in the body. And um, it turns out antidepressants, I told you, had anti-inflammatory properties. This was an interesting study that used fluvoxamine and SSRI, not for depression, but for people with COVID, and showed that they were much less likely to do bad, badly from having COVID. So zero of 80 patients got worse and had clinical deterioration if they were on this SSRI compared to six of 72 patients in the placebo group. So if you look now, one of the recommendations is to treat people with fluvoxamine because it appears that this is one of the anti-inflammatories. So um, this is just the, the last thing I want you to try to, um, if I've done my job, it won't be a shock at this point that if I told you diet, obesity, early life stress, uh, other kinds of things, leaky gut and the like, they can cause chronic inflammation and chronic inflammation can cause cardiovascular disease, heart disease, strokes, et cetera, diabetes, cancer, people know about this. But what I hope I've done is convinced you that depression is just like these other conditions. And it's something that um, uh, really is just part of the disease. And whether it's COVID causing 50% of people that have a clinical depression because of the inflammation, or whether it's sarcoidosis causing the inflammation leading to depression, the, uh, the important thing that you know is that this is treatable but you have to recognize it, you have to have it diagnosed, and then you have to get it treated by some experts. So, um, Sean had told me to try to make it half an hour, and I think I've come pretty close. I ran over a little bit, Sean, but um, that should hit the highlights. I assume the volume's been on, so people have been able to hear much of that. <laughs> um, but if not, we can start from the top. And uh, so, no. Wanted to get that information out there. And then if people have any questions, happy to uh, to answer them. No, you came through loud and clear. And we greatly appreciate the uh, the information that was very timely and uh, beneficial. Um, so our, our first question um, uh, on the antidepressants uh, comment, um, do you recommend them? And if so, what kind? 
So, I mean, you know, do I recommend antidepressants? It's like, do I recommend Tylenol? Well, if you don't have a headache or, you know, something. So, um, so if let's say it's depression, do I recommend them for depression? We do know this, that um, if it's at least moderate or severe depression, you know, uh, you can talk to the cows come home. And if it's severe depression, it's not going to fix it unless you add uh, medications. However, I tell patients, you know, I can throw antidepressants at them and they can sit on the couch and they just go down their throat and they stay just as depressed. So it takes a combination. I think of the antidepressants as bringing down the inflammation and it's a catalyst that allows people to make the changes that will make the difference, to exercise, to uh, start socializing again, to get out there, to find a purpose in life. So we know that antidepressants work faster than talk therapy, but talk therapy is much more likely to prevent you from relapsing back into a depression once you learn the tricks of how to pre prevent that sort of uh, snowballing effect of the negative thinking and the like. So the two together work better than either one alone. Um, I absolutely think that, um, you know, if, you're, if you have sarcoidosis, you should get whatever treatment that, and it's not getting better on its own, you should get whatever treatment the doctors say, this is gonna help the sarcoidosis. If you have depression, um, I think it's the same thing that you should get the right treatment for the right problem. In addition to that, you wanna, especially now with COVID going on, try to avoid doing the things that'll make it worse. So this is a bad time to start picking up alcohol to self-medicate. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we had a crisis in my family over the weekend and uh, we went out and my mom um, had a vodka with dinner and her mood went up, boom, immediately she felt much better. And, uh, you know, with a, you know, martini. And she knew what she was doing because she wanted that lift. But what is really misleading is that it makes you feel good. But if you keep doing it on a daily basis, Turns out alcohol is a central nervous system depressant and 25% of people who drink daily uh, more than two drinks a day will get a depression. So it's kind of misleading. So don't start self-medicating with alcohol. That's not the right treatment. Um, and don't uh, stop exercising. Exercise is a great antidepressant. So, you know, you gotta kind of pull these things together. Um, and, and had all of them aligned if you really wanna get, get over the depression. But it is treatable and it really can make a huge difference a lot of times just to remove that kind of level of depression off the top with the medication that lets you make the changes that'll help. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Adam. Um, sure. So our next question is we have um, a guest that um, uh, has severe anxiety and uh, panic attacks and the question is, is uh, could this be caused by the inflammation? And if so, what can this person do to prevent it? So again, great question. Um, one thing I'll tell you right off the bat is uh, as much as we know about depression, and I'm trying to get the word out about depression, we know much less about anxiety. Anxiety has been studied much less than depression has. So, um, and depression hasn't been studied enough and sarcoidosis is even less so. So, um, having said all of that, it, uh, uh, you can, there, there are, first of all, two kinds of anxiety, the way I think about it, uh, right from the first cut. The first type of anxiety is the kind that you weren't anxious before, and then you got depressed, and the anxiety came with the depression, and as your mood gets better, the anxiety goes down, and it looks like that as your anxiety goes up, your mood goes down, but it, you know, it's a chicken and egg thing. So, but it keeps company with your mood. That's the kind of anxiety that is just another symptom of depression. It's not on the SIGIM caps, but lots of people get OCD or general anxiety just when their depression gets worse. And that's, you gotta treat the depression. Luckily, the same medications we use for depression, like the SSRIs, all have indications for panic attacks. Uh, you know, Zoloft is good for depression and panic attacks. And, um, Paxil is good for PTSD. I mean, they all have these overlap kind of things. But then there's the other kind of anxiety, which is always there. It doesn't matter how your mood is and, uh, and people are anxious. So there are some uh, things, uh, general, general things about anxiety. The first thing is exercise is great because that it's a good way to burn off the anxiety. Sleep is really important and exercise can help with sleep. Um, same thing, don't self-medicate with alcohol and that kind of stuff, things that'll make it worse. Um, 
one thing I can tell you that gets overused is these benzodiazepines, um, Valium and Librium and all of these things. Um, different people have different philosophies. They're addicting um, and, uh, and they prevent cognitive behavioral therapy working. But the one thing I can tell you is if you're right now taking Xanax once a day to go to sleep, that's a bad thing to be on because Xanax uh, is a benzodiazepine that only lasts about six hours in your system. So if you're just taking it at night, come noon the next day, you start withdrawing and come the evening, you're in benzo withdrawal. So you that Xanax feels really good when you take it because you're withdrawing from Xanax. So you gotta be careful. There are medicines that can make it worse, uh, which reminds me by the way that um, steroids can make depression worse and they can make anxiety worse. So it's something to be aware of that in addition to the sarcoidosis, some of the medications we use can cause these kinds of symptoms. But, you know, that's a big topic, anxiety, and um, cognitive behavioral therapy is really good for a lot of these uh, panic attacks as well. Learning that panic attacks is really a drowning reflex and learning how to control your breathing uh, to get through it, these kinds of things. But that's a whole different lecture and discussion that I just don't have time to go through now. Very interesting. Um, Adam, thanks for that. Uh, we have a related question regarding um, depression and anxiety. Uh, so one of our attendees said uh, their doctor thinks depression, her, the, the doctor thinks the depression and anxiety is just because uh, you know, the, the patient is worried about sarcoidosis. Um, how, do, how does this person explain to the doctor this may be related to sarcoidosis? Well, so it turns out there's this guy named Sean who put together videos and your doctor can go and look at the video and actually learn about this from the video that this is what happens. Depression is caused by inflammation. This is something we are learning more and more about. I'll tell you just ironically that I am uh, now went from academia where the goal was to get more and more papers published to now the goal is to get more and more drugs to market to help people and come up with new treatments. And the treatment we're working on right now is to treat autoimmune diseases like sarcoidosis, rheumatoid arthritis and the like. But when we ran an assay and said, what does this look most like in its effect on the immune system? Of all the treatments that it looked like, it looked like an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And it's a more powerful version than antidepressants, but it's just interesting to tell you that antidepressants all have anti-inflammatory properties and that's not a coincidence. It's because all of many, not all, but many of these depressions are due to this. Yes, hypothyroidism causes depression, nothing to do with inflammation. Yes, cocaine will cause depression, nothing to do with inflammation, but for a significant number of people, that's it. And the word is getting out there. I could, if you asked me this 10 years ago, I'd say, gee, it's really hard to find papers on this. There's papers and conferences on this now every single month. People are starting to understand that the immune system is talking and the brain is getting caught in the crossfire here. Mm, interesting. Um, so you mentioned uh, drugs. What do you think about CBD and have you found that it helps with the inflammation and depression? So um, great question. So first of all, we have not been able to do studies on uh, THC or cannabis or any of these things because that goes way back to reasons. Uh, I actually, um, uh, I have had the privilege of working with Montel Williams who has MS and, and Montel has been a big proponent of, hey, this you know, is not an evil drug. This is something we need to investigate more. And it turns out that um, cannabis and all of the cannabinoids have receptors for them in our body. And there's CB1 and CB2. Those are the cannabinoid receptor one and two. And whether it's THC or CBD, there are receptors for these. But what's interesting is CB2 is where can, uh, cannabidiol, CBD binds and CB2 is on immune cells. And so it looks like in addition, CB2 is now approved in this country to treat epilepsy, particularly in young people in uncommon epilepsies. And I will tell you, we just have some research that was done at Hopkins that shows a souped up version of CBD that the companies uh, working on 
is very good at, at treating anxiety. But it, it is probably going to be the case, and I'm glad you asked about CBD, that CBD does have powerful anti-inflammatory properties and anti-anxiety properties. It's just, it's coming, but it's just taken so long. And I will tell you, when we try to even run in the lab some examples of comparing THC to CBD, we can't even order THC to come. There are so many restrictions on it. So at least CBD, which doesn't have the intoxicating effects of THC, uh, which is what's the ingredient in marijuana that gets people high, um, it really is the case that CBD has a very important role in being investigated to see its anti-inflammatory properties. Also, THC may also have important properties, just this country isn't ready yet on the federal level to let us do the research we need to do. But I would say I would talk to your doctor, the research is being done now. And I think that there are a lot of, uh, there's a conference going on right now that I talked at earlier today, where there was a lot of people talking about all the derivatives of CBD. And I think there's a new souped up CBD um, that's prescription coming to a FDA approved drug near you. Interesting. Um, uh, next question, Adam. Really, uh, I guess they would like for you to elaborate on the C-reactive protein again. Mm -hmm. um, the, our, our, one of our guests recently had their uh, level elevate from 3 to 11 in one month. Wow. Yeah, so, um, so there are only, uh, there are lots of things that, that you can measure, cytokine levels. So C-reactive protein is what gets turned on and released by the liver in response to IL-6, interleukin-6. And it turns out TNF-alpha and IL-6 are what are called pro-inflammatory cytokines. They are the first, they're the front line. You get infected by a bacteria, both of those go up first. It's what's called innate immunity. Your immune system doesn't need to learn to recognize bacteria. It will just recognize them when they come in and those IL-6 and TNF-alpha go right up. Unfortunately, lots of things can affect uh, IL-6. Um, just how much uh, fat cells you have in your body will affect IL-6, uh, for instance. But C-reactive protein turns out to be a good way of measuring the level of general inflammation in the body. And so many of the studies that are getting done now to look at treating immune-mediated depression are using C-reactive protein as a measure of how much is inflammation playing in this depression. But it also is a good readout for, hey, there's, there's some brewing here. If you're not depressed, um, there's still, if your C-reactive protein's up, that means there's inflammation coming from somewhere. And trying to get a handle on it and figuring out how to treat it is one of the things that we're just now, you know, trying to get going and, and have more and more targeted therapies. We have anti-TNF-alpha uh, antibodies that can bind, to, bind up TNF-alpha. We have IL-6 antibodies that can bind up IL-6. So these are all relatively new in the past decade or so. Um, they've come online. So we're getting better. We're not quite there yet, but that if your C-reactive protein's going up, then sounds like, and again, I don't know your situation. I'm not trying to, to do cocktail party sort of diagnosis, but I, I think your doctor would agree if it's going up, there's some inflammation happening and trying to figure out what that is uh, seems like an important thing to do. Very enlightening. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. I, I want to go back to uh, cannabis. So we have one of our um, one of our guests has a question, uh, and I'm going to mess up the pronunciation of this, but uh, their, their question was, can they take cannabis and fluoxetine? Flu yeah, that fluoxetine or prozac. Fluoxetine, yeah. Yeah, so fluoxetine has um, been around because since 1988, it's the first SSRI that came out which means it was the first medication that was safe to use. You can't kill yourself. Now, don't try it out, by the way. But uh, basically, you take as much Prozac as you want, and it, uh, it, it's extremely difficult to, to cause yourself any significant injury because Prozac's such a safe drug. So it's been around a long time. Um, the uh, the drug-drug interactions between THC, so I assume cannabis, they're talking about THC, um, cannabis is, you know, marijuana, it's the active ingredient 
in, uh, in marijuana. CBD is actually kind of the antidote. So CBD blocks a lot of the positive, or not positive, the, um, the, uh, the intoxicating effects of THC. So I say that because THC, for instance, um, THC, one of the things THC does that's not good is that if you have a history of psychosis or schizophrenia in your family, THC is a good way to make you uh, find that out that you, you were susceptible to it because it looks like in places where people had uh, risk factors for schizophrenia in their family and then uh, marijuana came in and people started using more marijuana, the rates of schizophrenia went up. And it turns out now people are using CBD to treat schizophrenia because it has the kind of the opposite effect. Um, now, I'm not saying it's, it's bad. Uh, it's certainly in the right context. It's a very, you know, useful drug and it's being evaluated for all sorts of things, um, pain and anxiety and the like. So with respect to drug-drug interactions with fluoxetine and, uh, and THC, I have to tell you, I actually don't know the answer. I can look into that and see if it is known. Again, because THC... <coughs> is a schedule one drug. One means it's the hardest drug. You can't write a prescription for it. Uh, you know, where it's been legalized, you can write a card for a dispensary, dispensary, but you cannot write a prescription. The FDA has not made it legal. Um, and so it's very hard to do research on it. I'm not aware of drug-drug interactions between THC and fluoxetine, but I can look into that uh, and see if that is known. I don't know the answer, but I don't know that it's been looked at or not. So if you and Ellen want to follow up with me, I can try to find that out. Okay, we will do. I think that would be great. Um, appreciate that. Um, how about, um, what are your thoughts on therapy? Is there a specific type of therapist that patients should look for? Yeah, so, um, uh, so there's a couple of things. The first thing is that there's no question if you look at studies that have been done, what studies, you know, if you say, I want to know, has this been tried in research and do we have good data to support it and this kind of stuff, cognitive behavioral therapy is your, your therapy because data has been uh, obtained um, many times over <clears throat> that CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which I'll explain what it is in a second, is, um, is highly effective at treating depression and preventing depression from happening again. So what is cognitive behavioral therapy? You know it, you just don't know you know it. When you've heard, if you get thrown off the horse, what do you do? The thing is to get back on the horse, that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Because if you get back on the horse, your anxiety will eventually come back down again and so you'll be able to ride. Um, incidentally, if you get back on that horse and you're on benzos like Valium and the like, your anxiety won't come down because it's already being blocked, which is why CBT doesn't work with uh, benzos. But having said that, um, that's an example of CBT, but CBT is something you learn over six to 12 weeks. So you don't just keep going forever. You learn its techniques that you learn how to you know, change the negative thinking and catch yourself making these assumptions that are not actually uh, accurate. And then once you learn that, you're done. And now you've got the tools. It's not like how long was I breastfed and you know, trying to get into your head about everything that ever happened to you. So CBT has a lot of data to suggest it's highly effective. Having said that, a lot of people get a lot of benefit from other types of therapy, um, whether it's you know, um, psychodynamic therapy where they do talk about their upbringing and all this stuff. And uh, a lot of people have a great benefit from it. Um, and I'm not saying that it isn't good. I'm just saying we don't have the data for the kinds of uh, therapies outside of cognitive behavioral therapy. That's just where we've had the best, uh, best research done. Very good, very good. Um, so we have a, um, maybe a, a, a question related to a patient who uh, is suffering with the symptoms of sarcoidosis. Uh, the family members uh, don't believe uh, that the patient is going uh, through the symptoms of sarcoidosis and depression. Is there any suggestions um, on how to communicate or share this uh, experience with them in relative to what the patient is going through? 
Yeah, so, um, and unfortunately this is, you know, there's lots of, um, I'm sorry, ignorance in the world. Uh, people have a lot of, uh, just because they don't know better um, and there's stigma about, you know, there's discrimination against people based on their color of their skin and what illness they have and what have you. So a lot of this is education. Um, and uh, so what I would say is, yes, education would be very helpful. There's lots of books. You can go online and uh, the National Institute of Mental Health has, you know, things that I can tell you are good. Don't go to Scientology. They're crazy. They're banned from France. They think <laughs> they're some kind of evil concoction. But if you go to, you know, reputable places, you can get good information. And then what I'd say is if you, if you have a chance and they love you, then say, let's go to a support group. Let's go to... Um, you know, uh, one of these um, uh, national organizations for depression uh, or for mental health, uh, and you can just look them up, they exist, um, and just go to a support group and have them talk to other people who are the loved ones of people who have this. These may be invisible symptoms, but they're not um, symptoms that are uh, uh, um, lacking in the full weight and, and magnitude of what they do to people. It's just, um, I have patients who have depression and MS and they say, gee, you know, Dr. Kaplan, I know it's terrible, but sometimes I wish I just dragged a leg or something because I don't get any sympathy and it feels like I'm just living day to day in hell. And, uh, and so, you know, it is difficult um, when people don't see it. Uh, a lot of times, I will tell you, I do believe a lot of times it's because they don't know how to fix it and they can't fix what they don't understand. So if you take them and say, you can really help me, I need your help, but I need your help based on understanding what this is, come to, you know, the, uh, the support group uh, of this national organization, whatever's in your area, um, and let's you know, learn about this together. I think that they'd be willing to come with you. Very good. I think that's very good. That happens more than not where family members are, are just not aware. You know, the person looks fine. Uh, you know, they, they, what's wrong? Everybody's having a tough time, you know, everything. And they just don't really understand what's going on on the inside. And, you know, as you said, below below the shoulders and above the shoulders, you know, uh, just, yeah. a, just a tough time, especially what we've all gone through the last 14 months, you know. Um, oh, my God. Absolutely yeah. great, Sean. Yeah. Um, so um, I have somebody that has challenges with sleeping through the night, you know, just can't get the appropriate level of sleep. And it's because they're, they're worried. They're worried about, you know, uh, the factors of what they're going through. Any suggestions on, you know, how not to worry at night or how to be more relaxed? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but the, actually you're 100% right. And it's kind of funny you say that because it's like, you know, I'm, you know, try not to worry because worrying is bad for you. That only makes you more worried. So I, I understand <laughs> how tough that is. But having said that, there, there are some absolute uh, things. One is, as I, you know, as we mentioned earlier, exercise is great for anxiety and it's great for sleep. So if you can try to find a way of getting exercise, ideally before the evening, because if you exercise right as you get into bed, you're not going to be able to sleep. The other thing is there's sleep hygiene, which is it teaches you what not to do. Like you actually get conditioned to get into bed and not fall asleep, and just start staring at the ceiling by doing it a lot. So one thing that good sleep hygiene is about is you get into bed, if you can't fall asleep, then you get up and you get into a chair and you read until you're tired and then you get back into the bed. The bed's only there for sex and sleep. You don't use it to just stare at the ceiling like uh, Dracula on a day pass. You don't wanna do that. You wanna make sure that you're uh, only using it for sleep. There are, if you put in sleep hygiene on, into Google, you'll get all of that list of all the things. The other thing is now there's all these apps that are about relaxation. So whether it's yoga or meditation or, you know, your favorite, you know, um, focus relaxation where you focus on your feet, you relax them, then your ankles and your calves and you work your way up to your head. All of these things will help. And then the last thing is what people often don't realize, again, um, all everything in moderation, including moderation, 
Um, drinking's fine, one or two drinks, uh, you know, on a weekend, great. But one glass of alcohol a day at any time of the day will mess your sleep up that night. So alcohol is a no-no if you're having trouble with sleep and you want to find a way to do it, as is tea and coffee and all those things, you know, you don't realize. My wife is uh, Brazilian and there's this um, soda I love called Guarana. And uh, she told me that it just has more caffeine than, than, you know, than Red Bull in it. And I was like, oh my God, I can't have this at night. So uh, lots of things are stimulants that you may not know about. So, but if you try those things, you might be uh, surprised at how, um, how much better your sleep will get. Um, you know, just once a day for 10 minutes doing a relaxation exercise can work wonders. Well, Adam, it's the, it's the ultimate compliment. Uh, we've had one of our, one of our um, guests asked if you are currently accepting patients. <laughs> And again, thank you so much for the compliment. What I can tell you, unfortunately, is because in December, um, I switched over to working for this drug company and Hopkins just couldn't see their way uh, to letting me do that and stay at Hopkins because they had concerns about if I was working in a company and something happened, would it sully the name of Hopkins? I think that's why they did it. But um, so I'm now not at Hopkins. I'm in the process of trying to figure out where I could see patients and how I can do billing and all that stuff. So no, thank you for the kind, uh, kind, um, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, positive appraisal of what you think I could do. But trust me, there are lots of good psychiatrists out there. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately I'm just not in a position to take patients at this point. I hope to be in towards the end of this year, once COVID's over and I can open an office somewhere, but thank you. I appreciate the, the kind words. Well, we hope to stay connected, Adam, uh, and, uh, and welcome you to the Life and Breath family. Uh, we try to provide a community um, that we can share and disseminate information and be able to help individuals attack each and every day uh, to make the next day tomorrow a better day than today. And uh, I think if we can take it one step at a time uh, and understand that there's other people out there that can be supportive, uh, that can give that lifeline of just listening sometimes, uh, that, that's going to help us through this anxiety period and uh, a possible stretch where we go through and some things aren't going as well as we would like them to. Um, in closing, is there anything based on the questions, based on the dialogue uh, that we've, we've shared over the last hour? Is there anything from a takeaway that you could share uh, with, with everybody that's still on the call? I mean, I, you know, quite honestly, for me, the takeaway is right from the top of the hour, which is, uh, and maybe I could come back and talk about purpose in life, but you, Sean, are the takeaway, which is it makes a huge difference for your health. If you can find, you know, life under altered circumstances, no one wants a disease like sarcoidosis, but finding out what you can do, uh, turns out that these diseases make people more sensitive, more uh, empathetic, uh, more understanding of, of other people. And you, I think, are the best example of, you know, if you can find your purpose in life, you took the loss of your mom and you've created this community and it's a great role model for other people. You're, not everybody's going to start their own community, but just finding something to get engaged in that is meaningful to you, that reaches out and helps other people, that's really good for your health. So that's oh, what I awesome. Um, Dr. Kaplan, we greatly appreciate your time, the information that you shared and your partnership with the Life and Breath Foundation. I wanna thank those that have uh, tuned in this evening and those that will view uh, this speaker series content uh, dealing with uh, depression and sarcoidosis. Um, uh, the Life and Breath Foundation has uh, resources and tools that we'd like to share with you on our website, uh, www.lifeandbreath.org. We also would invite you to uh, like our Facebook page and stay connected and join the community as we continue to disseminate further information as we go through the year. Uh, we have our next speaker series coming up in June. We'll get that on the website and share exactly uh, the topic and who will be our guest speaker as we continue uh, this process. So 
Um, we want to thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Adam, we, we hope you'll join us again, and we hope everybody uh, be well, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you again very soon. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everybody, for coming.